Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. David Steinman. David Steinman has 25 years experience working with foreign democracy revolutions. He was a consulting expert to the United States National Security Council regarding the removal of Haiti's baby doc, Duvalier, and to the exiled Aristide government. Mr. Steinman assisted anti-communist resistant movements in Southeast Asia with the United States Council for World Freedom. He advised Chinese dissidents and co-authored the nonviolent civil disobedience campaign strategy for the Ethiopian Democracy Movement's Surprise 2005 victory. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this emerging leader of the global democracy movement. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. David Steinman. David? Well, uh, Stanley, thank you very much for your introduction. And I'd like to thank everybody here for the opportunity to speak to you today. I know most of you are businessmen and women. And as a matter of fact, before committing myself to the problem of world freedom, I went to business school and worked in the business world myself. So I can understand what it means to have to make business decisions in a context of economic recession and uncertainty. And that's why I wanted to talk today, because as we all know, America is in trouble. And there's a lot of disagreement about the best way to get the economy moving again. Some want to increase government spending. But as we all know, we're already $15 trillion in the hole and change. Others say we should cut taxes and spending, but the biggest parts of our national budget, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and defense, are sacred cows considered virtually impossible to cut. Well, I'm here to say that there is a way to cut the defense budget and that we all have a role to play in this. And we can cut it enough that we can solve our economic problems over the next couple of decades with the savings. But we're going to have to think bigger, more long-term, and outside the box. The United States spent around $20 trillion on wars and national security threats in the last century. That was for World War I, World War II, Korea, the Cold War, Vietnam, the first Iraq War. And that doesn't even include the lost opportunity cost. That's an incredible amount of money. At the rate we're going right now, with two or three trillion dollars already spent on war just since the year 2000, it looks like we're already well on our way to dropping yet another 20 trillion in the coming decades. And if we think we're barely keeping our heads above water now, believe me, that next 20 trillion is an economic tsunami. And it's heading our way right now. Now, Let's really analyze the problem. People commonly assume that America's wars and national security threats were due to different causes. The assassination at Sarajevo in World War I, Hitler's invasion of Poland, Soviet imperialism, and so on. But if you look closer, they share a common denominator. They were all caused by foreign dictators. Dictators are the bad neighbors on the global block. They tend to stir up regional crises and external threats to distract their people from the lousy job they're doing and rally nationalist sentiment behind them. And when a single man or a tiny clique can make decisions of war and peace and economic policy without having to account to a Congress or a parliament, that government is far more likely to create local conflicts, destabilizing poverty and underdevelopment. 
and these regional tensions created by dictators constantly subject the lifelines on which our economy depends, our foreign trade, our shipping lines, our alliances, to external shocks. And mounting responses to these shocks, to these political and commercial risks, costs an unbelievable amount in money and sometimes even in lives. Hitler, of course, is a famous example of this. But there have been lots of others. Just to take some recent cases, you've got the butchery in the Balkans, started by Milosevic in the 90s, Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, the lesser known but equally deadly Ethio-Eritrean War of 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was an earlier one. And then there are the humanitarian challenges forced on us by foreign dictators, the genocides, the crimes against humanity. They force on us a very difficult choice between risky and expensive intervention or the shame of doing nothing. So finally, even though these dictators didn't set out to threaten us, sooner or later, everybody looks to America to protect some small country that's the victim of aggression, to keep the sea lanes open, to send humanitarian aid, deal with the refugees, and generally pick up the mess that some little megalomaniac somewhere has created. And these dictators don't want to change. They can't, in fact, because the minute they do, they'll be out of power, in jail, or even worse, as we've recently seen in the case of Libya. So we're looking at more and more of these costly foreign burdens being thrust on us in the coming decades, and they're going to divert our increasingly scarce resources from our domestic problems. Now, most people assume that the world will eventually sort itself out, that good will triumph over evil, and these dictators will somehow just disappear on their own, as we have seen happen in a few places around the world. And the future will be a happy and democratic one for everybody. But that's not necessarily going to be the case. It's true that the oppressed people of the world are standing up and demanding freedom like never before. And the cause of human rights and democracy appeared to be winning during the past several decades when we saw one dictator after another being toppled through people power revolutions right up until the recent Arab Spring. Even Time Magazine just today announced that their person of the year is a generic protester. But if you step back and you look at the world situation overall, it's less encouraging. Some of democracy's advances have stalled or even been reversed. In the Middle East, in Latin America, in Africa, it's happening in strategically important countries like Russia, Iran, Venezuela, Nigeria, Kenya. Even Egypt's outcome is still in doubt. According to Freedom House, an organization that tracks these things, about 20% of the world's countries have actually gone backwards in the last couple of years. In fact, dictators still control more than half the nations on Earth. Especially China is now competing with us for influence around the world, offering an authoritarian model of government. And by virtue of its sheer size, China is slated to become the richest and most influential country in a few decades. So the outcome for the external environment in which America is going to have to survive, whether it will be one of relative peace and stability, or one in which we're constantly buffeted by ill winds is still an open question. And unless we take an even more active interest in global freedom now, while we still have the power and the means to shape our external environment, the future could turn out to be very, very different from what we expect. So that's the bad news. The good news is there is a way to stabilize the world 
and reduce our expensive overseas commitments. We can do this with smarter, more effective, better funded democracy promotion. Now, some people say that when we promote democracy abroad, we're imposing our own values on others, that it's cultural or economic imperialism. But every survey ever conducted on this subject has made clear that people everywhere really do want to be free, that it's a natural biological impulse to want to have as much control as possible over decisions and events that affect us. So that's why we're not meddling when we promote democracy, because we're simply siding with the people in those countries rather than with the unrepresentative crooks that are holding them hostage at gunpoint. Now, many of you may know that the US already has some democracy promotion programs. In fact, we spend around a billion dollars a year on them, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's not nearly enough. So what else could America do to better promote world freedom? Especially, what can we do in those difficult cases where our government needs the cooperation of certain foreign dictators like China or even North Korea? Well, we can send soldiers. That's too costly and it's often counterproductive. Our soft power, our trade, foreign aid, diplomacy, and moral authority has so far demonstrated its limits in the last few years, especially with our current budget constraints. And the UN, the UN, more than half of its members are dictators themselves. So it's of very little use when it comes to rolling back tyranny. But the debate over whether and how much America should confront dictators overlooks the fact that the greatest engine for social change in the 21st century isn't what governments do, it's what the private sector does. Social entrepreneurship, the promotion of various causes by private individuals and organizations is now having a greater effect on global affairs than even the United States government. Just to give you one example, private humanitarian giving is roughly four times what the US government gives. And although democracy promotion by the American and friendly governments is certainly needed, generally speaking, it's the private sector now that's often better positioned to help people overseas secure for themselves stabilizing representative government. Now, we can't make a country democratic. The people living in those countries basically have to do it themselves if it's going to be sustainable. But we can help them. The private sector can provide know-how, money, technology, services, and moral support. And our government, meanwhile, can shrug and tell the dictators that it does have to work with that it can't help what the private sector does, sort of like a good cop, bad cop thing. Now, maybe you're wondering how are you going to win a revolution with that? Dictators have guns, they have soldiers, they have dogs, they have bugging equipment, they have torture chambers. How are free private sectors going to combat these with know-how and money? Well, if you look at history, technology can sometimes be a game changer. And I'm not saying we can eliminate dictatorship altogether, but there is a technology that has the potential to help us avoid spending a lot of that next 20 trillion. It's a kind of software, actually, it hasn't always worked, but it has proven effective many, many times throughout history and around the world. And it is deployable by the private sector. It's the science of nonviolence and the communications technologies that go along with it, such as the internet, social media, texting, and so on. 
Nonviolence is often misunderstood as passively accepting whatever punishment one's oppressor wants to dish out until he starts feeling sorry for you and has a change of heart. It's also sometimes associated with some of its more dramatic manifestations that we see on TV, the people power demonstrations and rallies. But that's not really what nonviolence is all about. Nonviolence is a form of psychological and economic warfare. You see, dictators rely on a limited number of pillars of support to maintain their hold on power. They have the army, they have the police, they have the bureaucracy, they have foreign support, they have money, they have moral authority, they control the media. And very often in these authoritarian countries, it's the people themselves who unwittingly prop up these pillars of support by obeying the dictatorship, paying taxes to it, and working for it. And nonviolence teaches oppressed people to recognize the role that they're playing in their own oppression and provides them with techniques they can use to remove the support until the dictatorship collapses. Just to give you some examples of cases where nonviolence has effectively brought freedom to people. You've got India with Mohandas Gandhi. You've got uh, Poland where the Solidarity Movement got rid of a communist dictatorship. You've got South Africa. You've got the Philippines where people power revolution overthrew Ferdinand Marcos. There was the overthrow of Pinochet in Chile, the Argentinian junta, Baby Doc Duvalier, Serbia, Ukraine and of course our own civil rights movement in the 1960s. And there's others, all done with a minimum of violence. Now nonviolence isn't a magic wand. People using it are sometimes hurt, imprisoned, or even killed by the dictators they oppose. And that's not to say that there isn't sometimes a need for armed intervention and especially deterrence in this world. But people are increasingly recognizing that nonviolence represents a way that ordinary people can get together and move a country from dictatorship to freedom without guns and without costly U.S. military intervention. The know-how has matured with practice, and it's now often applied for a fraction of what war would cost to achieve the same goal. But democracy promotion and nonviolence, despite their proven ability to deliver more bang for the buck than war, are still grossly underfunded. Over and over, I've worked with foreign democracy groups and seen how the lack of resources holds them back. I've seen an Ethiopian uprising that could have saved a million lives and stabilized a very dangerous region fizzle instead because of a lack of just a few million dollars to sustain strikers and protesters. I've seen brilliant Chinese democracy leaders abandon the struggle because they had to make a living. Groups like these need money for nonviolence training. They need salaries for their leaders and their staff. They need counter jamming technology to broadcast their messages over radio. They need money for secure communications or feeding people during mass people power actions when everybody's got to go into the street for a few weeks. So to the extent that our government can do more, these organizations need you to tell your representatives that this is one area where a little investment can pay huge dividends. But the private sector has got to recognize its own financial interest in this issue too and step up its donations of money, skills, services, and supplies. We have to coordinate better with the democracy promotion activities in other countries and turn this thing into a real global revolutionary movement and regain the momentum that was lost in the last few years. Now, a free world isn't going to solve all our problems. Tensions over nationalism, ethnicity, and resources will continue to dominate our planet for the foreseeable future. There's still going to be disease and poverty, 
but the freer the world is, the more likely it is that these tensions can be resolved peacefully. We'll finally have an effective UN, and a free world won't end terrorism, but it will help drain the swamp of poverty and injustice that feeds it. With stability and economic development slowly replacing war around the world, we'll have stronger foreign markets for our goods and our services. This will grow jobs here at home and help our economy tremendously. We'll be able to reallocate resources to productive uses that can benefit all mankind. And there's also the small matter, of course, of unleashing the planet's human and creative potential. The greatest benefit, of course, will be the decrease in human suffering. Fewer hungry orphans, fewer grieving families, fewer amputated and wounded veterans. As I watch the renewed prestige that the authoritarian model of government is getting around the world these days, it reminds me of what I read about the 1930s when we watched fascism spread and did nothing because we thought our own interests were not affected. And then all of a sudden, it was almost too late, and then we were in a lot of trouble. And now that the responsibility for the future of the world is up to our generation, maybe that's a lesson that we ought to carefully consider because we still have a window of opportunity in which we can dispel the darkness of authoritarianism with the light of human rights and freedom, not arrogantly or recklessly, but in a quiet, determined, and especially a sustained way. But we'd better do it soon before that window closes. Otherwise, it could become a lot more difficult. The dictators appear powerful, but the real power in those countries lies latently in their oppressed populations. And if we, using democracy promotion, can effectively link up with the oppressed people of the world, together we will make an unstoppable combination. So democracy promotion, both in human and financial terms, offers an excellent risk-reward ratio for when we invest in foreign democracy revolutions, not with soldiers, but with our money, our technology, our know-how, and our moral support, we buy at a reasonable cost a world that's a little calmer, a little more stable, and better able to deal with its many challenges. The future of our country and of our way of life may depend on whether we do this or not. Thank you very much.